So welcome everyone to this exciting session. I'm Martin Ramsey and I'm gonna be hosting. Officially this, sense, uh, this session is called the Showcase Effective Teaching Practices in Sakai, but frankly, behind the scenes, we've been calling it Teaching with the Stars. I guess that makes me Tom Bergeron, not really. Um, <laughs> But that's exactly what you're going to get in this session. Four stars who are going to show you some of the wonderful things they've been doing with Sakai. And it's going to be an exciting and educational hour. Now, to help us with the showcase, I'd like you to help me welcome our two Sakai superfan panelists. Julianne Morgan, wave at him, Julianne, is the academic engagement lead at the University of Dayton. In addition to helping faculty learn best how to use Sakai at the University of Dayton, she's been very active uh, as a part of the Sakai global community particularly making contributions in the marketing team. And so Julianne, thank you for being here, glad to have you. And we also have Christina Schweibert, wave at him, Christina, there you go, from Northwest State Community College. Christina is the Instructional Design and Distance Learning Coordinator at, NCS, at NSCC. She helped convert Northwest State, I didn't know this about you, Christina, from WebCT to Sakai in 2009, wow, and she's never looked back. Like Julianne, Christina is extremely active in the Sakai community, serving on a number of teams. It seems like everywhere you turn, Christina is making a contribution. So, Christina, we're really glad to have you as a super fan panelist. Um, just so you know how this showcase is going to work, we'll hear presentations from each of our panelists. They have no more than seven minutes to present. So this is going to be fast and furious. And watch me to call time if session gets a little bit long. Um, and following each presentation, then we'll hear from our panelists. Julianne and Christina will give us give the presenter feedback, and then it'll be time for questions from you, the audience. So if you have questions, either type them in the chat or use that QA tool that's down at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'll get as, to as many of your questions as we can before we have to move on to the next presentation. So ready to get started? Let's get going. Uh, let's start with Amy Dries. Amy is on faculty at Northwest State Community College, where her field is particularly focused on composition and literacy. Amy is going to talk to us about the Sakai rubrics and why you should love them. Take it away. OK, so uh, my first thing I have to say is to uh, Wilma that, yes, I have indeed shortened the presentation. So without further ado, five reasons to use rubrics and hopefully to love them. Reason number, and my screen is locked. Ah, there we go. The five reasons are they're easy to create, they're flexible, they're student friendly, they're instructor friendly, and they're research based. They're easy to create. All it takes is going into manage tools, adding rubrics as a tool within the course. You can see the tab, the screenshots from my from my program. And then once you have it, you get a criterion. Here my criterion is, does it exist? And then the number of um, subcategories that you're interested in. In this case, this is an ungrading rubric in that um, this, this assignment has to simply be to get its points. So yes, it does exist. The student has completed the assignment. The student is working on it. Something was submitted, but for some reason it does not comply with the full guidelines of the assignment or nothing exists. Um, adding criterion is easy. Adding a rubric as easy as hitting the button. Rubrics are flexible. You'll notice that here's two of the rubrics I'm using in the same course, the simple doesn't exist rubric and the more complex thesis development style mechanics and sources rubric for my argument essay. Um, each of these categories, you can see I can define, <coughs> excuse me, extensively and have point values that go with them. Rubrics are student friendly. Once I grade something, my students see what category, any alteration I have in points, and um, basically get a reason from me quickly. They also see the rubric before they do the assignment, which means we're all on board. It's never a secret. What are my criteria for grading something? <laughs> Additionally, they're instructor friendly. They see my criteria ahead of time. They get a lot of feedback here. And then that leaves my gradebook comment for things that matter specifically to this student. I don't have to write over and over again purpose. 
I have to um, talk about this particular student's purpose and I've got the room to do it. They are research based. I do not have enough time in a five to seven minute presentation to give you all the research. If you're interested, drop me an email. Um, basically, rubrics are one of the more researched forms of feedback, and they work with all styles and types of feedback situations, from an almost strict ungrading situation, as you can see with my Does It Exist rubric, all the way to intensive, it must have these 17 things to this criteria type rubric. In addition, um, those little extra bubbles that you saw back at students, I can add specific criteria related comments. Um, everything about them is for a student. The research shows they love them. I definitely love them. And with that, I'm going to ask for questions on rubrics because they're easy to create they're flexible they're student friendly they're instructor friendly and boy does the research prove they work okay so amy um let's let's hear from our panelists um julianne do you want to go first sure i will uh thank you so much for this presentation i like the five things that's a great Plus to keep in mind, I really liked uh, how you talked about ungrading rubric because I've been reading the book on grading, but I do have a question. Um, can you imagine other kinds of rubrics that could work with the ungrading format? Like I, I like the way you had yours, like they didn't do it or they did do it, but are there other kinds of like wordings or strategies you could use with rubrics and un ungrading? Oh, most definitely. So um, like the longer rubric that you saw before the, uh, the um, say my narrative final rubric here. Um, th this kind of feedback could be changed to definite ungrading feedback. So instead of having five categories, this is a this is an A, a through F course. Um, instead of having five categories, the ungrading rubrics that we're creating for the next round of comp one have three here, which are basically um, publishable, which is, or finished, um, re uh, rework, and redo. Rework being the category that encompasses the C through B grades. Um, and it has basically the same setup, but within, instead of developing adequate and good, the things to work on are all one category here. So narrative coherence has a standard for narrative coherence written out in paragraph form. And that way they know if they end up in that at all, they need to rework towards the, the category that is publishable or finished. Then what happens is they go through that as many times as they want. Instead of you get a grade and we wander off, you get a grade. And if you want to do the rework or the redo, you've got the information to step through. Any Thank other, you so much. Any other comments, Julianne, before we go on to Christina? Yep, that was a great explanation. Thank you, Amy. Okay, so Christina, you're our other super fan. What comments do you have? I was just uh, curious how much you have to provide the individualized comments versus just relying on the sort of boilerplate um, paragraph that's under good, adequate, developing. Um, I generally end up providing two heavy paragraphs on a major paper, one on content and one on mechanics, um, in addition to the rubric itself. But that's because the current rubric, if you look at the mechanics example here, um, few major mechanical errors or typographical errors. I didn't list all the major mechanical errors. We don't have time for that. Um, so what I do then in the paragraph, you can see mechanically we're having with problems with writing out numbers 10 and below, MLA style, contractions. And this particular student um, didn't understand what an alma mater was. Um, so we had to discuss how we use that in, in, uh, in, in uh, formal writing um, and then unnecessary changes in verb tense. Does that answer the question? It does. Thank you, Amy. 
Other comments, Christina, before we go on to the audience? Nope. A Amy knows I like her rubrics. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And I love your help with them. Thank you. So. All right. Well, well, Amy, we've been peppered with uh, comments in the chat and some, <laughs> some questions too. Let me start with what might be an easy one. Uh, Mark Goldbeck says, I noticed that the student scores are listed to the right of the rubric. Is that score given based on the instructor or does it automatically populate? I know the answer, but I'll let you talk about that. Um, when I choose a category, say I choose good, um, it automatically populates with a 24 in this particular case. However, uh, I think I've got an example. Let me pop back through. Um, and my screen's frozen. Um, there you go. So you can see here, I changed that 24 to a 26 in this particular case. One of the choices uh, when you set up a rubric is whether or not you want to adjust individual student scores. I always turn on adjust individual student scores because that way it gives me the ability to do ranges of points and not have to worry about a category for every point value. Excellent. Okay, we've got uh, one that I, I know Dave Evelyn is on because he's asked a question, but this is not a question from him. It's it's includes him. Um, someone has said as an anonymous attendee, could you work in the benchmarking idea that was shared in the assignments presentation earlier, the last presentation? Could you work that into a rubric? Absolutely. And um, rubrics and rubrics and feedback based grading of all sorts are great companions because the most common feedback that you give you place in the rubric and then you use the additional space for things that are particular to that student to reach that benchmark so um, this could be a series of benchmark standards and then instead of having five different categories, I would have one big category of 17 different things, um, then give them a score on the side and say in the little comment, you missed things seven, eight, nine, and 10, or whichever portions of the benchmark they did not achieve that time through. Um, a long answer to a short question, but yes, they work nicely together. There you go. And this one, this one's kind of related. Um, can rubrics be leveraged with group submissions? Also, could students leverage the rubrics for peer evaluation? And again, I know the answer is yes, but elaborate on that a little bit. Um, so having the students, I, I, I can't, if I use the peer evaluation function, the whole, it sorts out the papers for me and everything else, I can't have the students use a built-in rubric to evaluate. What I do instead is I actually give them in the prompt box rubric questions that they answer. Um, so yes, <laughs> my students do use these rubrics with each other, but I cannot attach a Sakai rubric to a peer edit directly. I have to sort of make some adjustments to make that happen. Um, in group work, one of my categories always in the peer to peer evaluations is did your peer contribute to the best of their ability to this project and they get to um, rubricize that and it, it solves a lot of problems about arguments about did you do everything you could do. Um, in that they have the discussion and their choices are absolutely we believe so, we're not sure, and no. Yeah, there you go. Um, so yeah. Okay, good. Um, and I'll, I'll just make the comment that Wilma says that we are working on enabling scorable rubrics for student peer review yeah. in a future release of Sakai, but we don't have that yet. And, um, and the workaround is not particularly hard. It simply is I copy and paste a copy of the rubric and attach that to peer evals. Right. Then they just download it and fill it out and then upload it again. It's yeah. It, it's not a huge hack. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, and uh, Amy, it makes me, uh, we're basically, we're out of time, Amy, <laughs> for, for your session. <laughs> um, but it makes me think about um, that I was using um, rubrics and I didn't even call them rubrics back when I was working in manufacturing for basically evaluating um, employees. You know, that was, a, that was a rubric, just we didn't call it that. And that's a great segue to our next presenter, Philip Van Hooser. 
Um, he is the founder and partner of Leaders Ought to Know, a non-academic organization, so not a school, um, that uh, doing leadership development with all kinds of folks. And he's, uh, he's going to talk about the, the organization, which is called Leaders Ought to Know, and, and why they ended up using Sakai for what they're doing. So, Phil, off you go. Well, thank you very much, Martin. I uh, appreciate those kind words, and I also appreciate all that tuned in to watch a non-academic present and uh, talk about my experience with Sakai and all that's gone forward. As Martin just said, since 1988, I've been a full-time professional speaker and trainer, sharing topics uh, to help leaders and organizations with leaders get better. Now, I've done it on different stages in the form of keynotes and training programs, et cetera, different states, different countries even, if you will. But I always use the same methodology, and that methodology, of course, was the spoken word in person to my audience that was in front of me. That was 98, 1988 and beyond. However, with the turn of the, of the century, about 2025, and by, certainly by 2010, um, technology had caught up with my industry. And it became very clear to me that if I wanted to continue to share information in a way and reach as broad of an audience as I possibly could, I needed to look at how I might be able to incorporate technology into the sharing of and developing of leaders in a distant, on-demand uh, sort of a way. But I want to stress to you that I am not an early adapter. I, uh, as not being a techie per se, I uh, was a little cautious and wanted to make sure that whatever learning management system that I might have employed, I would do it in such a way that was comfortable to me. So for my purposes, I started out with, if you will, four developmental rules that would also align themselves with five business rules. Four developmental rules, five business rules that I followed throughout. Here's the four developmental rules. First of all, whatever I did, whatever learning management system I used, as I overlaid my material, my content with that system, it had to be easy to develop. As I said, I'm not a techie, and so therefore, I want to make sure that I understood what the techniques and, and the technology, but I also wanted to understand it to the point that I could explain it to others. Number one, it had to be easy to develop. Number two, it had to be easy to administer. I was not about, as a small business person, I was not about to hire a consultant or keep a consultant online that would month after month after month manage this system for me. I had to be able to do it in-house. Number three uh, rule for development was it had to be easy to access. Our clients that run the gamut of industries and, 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 and uh, industry types had to be able to find this, this tool and be able to use it to their greatest advantage very easily. And then finally, fourth uh, developmental point is it had to be easy to navigate. Once they found it, they needed to be able to use it without any, any anxiety or stress. Now, uh, now, Sakai offered all four of those in spades, if you will, very early on. However, you'll remember that I said I had to have five business decisions also met. The five business rules I focused on were these. Number one, whatever we do must be beneficial for our clients. We always promise to deliver more than we, than we promised, if we would. And this product needed to be able to do the same thing. It had to be beneficial. It had to be affordable, affordable for us and affordable for our clients. Number three, it had to be customizable. If we were going to use this LMS for a very variety of different kinds of organizations, then quite frankly, we needed to have a product that they could customize and feel as if it was their own. Number four, it had to be unique. In some way, this product had to differentiate me from the hundreds, even thousands of speakers and trainers that were also getting into LMSs and, and introducing their, their, their content online. And finally, and make no mistake about this, it's certainly not last and least, but finally, this had to be profitable. Again, I'm an entrepreneur, a small business owner, and I had to have something that would justify the expense and in the turn, make me some money. Well, since 2010, when we first 
joined with Sakai and introduced the Leaders Ought to Know Learning Platform, we've had all kinds of clients from all kinds of industries that have joined with us. We've had great testimonials to that effect. We've had manufacturing and healthcare. We've had real estate and agribusiness. We've had finance and even technology related industries that have embraced this concept as delivered by Sakai. Now, a couple of things to understand. This, pro this, this platform for us did a couple of very important things. First of all, you see a video, a screenshot of a video captured. That is one of over 200 videos that are contained within the, the Sakai platform under the name Leaders Ought to Know. Not only are there 200 plus videos, there's more than 150 what we refer to as learning activities, interactive activities that will add and support what we've been, do, uh, what we've been doing as far as the video is concerned. Those learning activities uh, include a variety of different things, but quizzes and articles and chat functions so that we can get people interacting with one another, sharing information, if you will. It includes tutorials that can help along the way. It even includes mentoring and journaling prompts. Now, these are the things that we have incorporated into the system, and the system has worked very, very successfully for us. In the end, though, the results are what they are. I've undertaken a number of different uh, challenges, if you will, in my 35 years in business. I've tried new things, and frankly, I've abandoned some of them because they didn't work the way that I wanted. But as far as this LMS and as far as Sakai's support of it, it has worked exceptionally well. Specifically, the five results that we, uh, that we measure and that we trumpet to others like you today are these. Number one. This product and the LMS, the Sakai platform that, that supported it, allowed us to differentiate ourselves in a very crowded uh, personal development marketplace. Number two, it offered educational options for our clients that were separate and distinct from just in-house, in-person offerings. Number three, it expanded our audience. It broadened the audience out there to people who would have never seen me in person, but who might have benefited from the content and the information that I shared by way of this online option. Number four, it extended, it extended my professional longevity. I'm getting a little long in the tooth. I can't do this forever, but the reality of it, capturing the essence of who I am, what I do, and what I believe can go on beyond myself. But the final two are the two that are important to me, maybe important to some of you, but I need to state them clearly. Number, the, I guess that's number five. There, were, there was a new revenue stream that was developed as a result of this option that before 2010 or so had not been available to me. And the last uh, result, we've made some money. We made some money, and for an entrepreneur who believes in the free enterprise system, this is an opportunity to use technique and a tool that Sakai provides for us to be able to further our goals and objectives in serving our customers and also being able to su support ourselves. It's been a bit great experience. I'm glad to be able to share it here today, and I'll look forward to hearing uh, from any questions that might follow. Thank you, Phil. Well, let's let's start. I, I know that this is a little bit out of the, the, the realm of, of probably many of our audience but Amy let's let me call on you and see what uh, what feedback you have for uh, for Phil there she is Martin did you mean me I well I, it doesn't matter oh we, yeah we, okay we can do Christina first I'm sorry that's right I promised them I was going to switch back and forth my bad okay Christina we'll go to you first um, I was interested when you were talking about all of the different learning activities you've built into your, um, I'm going to call them classes, but um, did you use a lot of the built-in out-of-the-box Sakai tools or did you plug in um, like third-party outside tools? We used a lot of third-party outside tools. In other words, we trapped into as much creativity from our developmental team as we possibly could, but we made it sure... <coughs> excuse me, we made sure that, that we stayed within the confines of what the system could offer and what it could provide. And we tried to utilize those to the greatest of ability possible. But I guess in answer to your question, simply it was a combination of both. Anything else, Christina? Uh, I just, I, I was curious about that, but uh, 
have you gotten a lot of good feedback from your clients that you know, the Sakai community can steal and make use of to continue to improve? Well, I realize that the Sakai community basically consists, at least uh, as of today, of the academic community. And so the profit uh, margin or the not the profit margin, but the profit uh, profit intention behind it for us may be a little bit different and uh, academia may not see it the way we saw it. But our clients love this process and love the availability of it and the usability of it. So we have gotten a lot of good feedback. Some of our clients have used this for years now. Others have used it to, to satisfy a particular need they had in the moment and then moved on. But it has continued to be a good learning management system. I will be honest with you, here at 12 years in, we're in the process right now of developing and trying to envision what the next generation of online learning is going to look like. And we're trying to be on the cutting edge or at least ahead of the curve. And so things will be changing in the days ahead. But the reality of it is looking backward, we've had a great run. Excellent. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Now, Amy, sorry, <laughs> your turn. Give Phil some feedback and questions. Sure. Thank you so much, Philip. I've never actually seen Sakai in a business use case before. So I really appreciate seeing that because I come from purely the academic standpoint. Right. Um, so it's really fantastic to see. I'm curious about how you um, generate a profit. Like do, do your users swipe a credit card and then that gets access to the course? Because we're trying to do the same thing on our campus. We're trying to make it easier for people to just like sign up for one-off courses. So I was curious about how you implement that. I love you. And even though you come from an academic background, you have a, a, a free enterprise spirit because you say, how do we make profit off of this? <laughs> Believe me, we ask that question ourselves regularly. First of all, we opted not for there to be a one-off swipe your credit card option. We, we are a small organization and therefore we really couldn't manage that effectively. Instead, we sold this product to corporations that would be incorporating a number of their people maybe a number of brand new supervisors, maybe their entire supervisor group, or in many cases, supervisors and managers from all over the United States who might not be able to gather together for a live program were able to benefit collectively by way of this process. The, the best way, and again, I wanna stress, if there was a larger organization with more labor manpower hours available, they might have uh, tackled it differently. But for us, we felt selling to one client who served many users was better than trying to sell to many users and therefore um, take too much of our time. I will remind you and other viewers that this is just one revenue stream. It's not the primary revenue stream in the business that we offer. I'm still speaking and training to live audiences around the world. However, this is a tool that we can support what we've done and, and help them going forward. Anything else, Julianne? Uh, I guess I just have one follow-up question. Since the since it's all people usually come from the same place, that means they're all kind of doing the same the discussion strategy, discussion forums at the same time, right? So you're not having people post in 2019 and someone post in 2022 to that thread. It's all kind of happening a little bit more synchronously. You that is true. However, we also had a feature that allowed past clients from past organizations for in the in the interactive tool, the, mm -hmm. the, the chat tool, to be able to hear what people were saying before them, during them, and even after them if they chose to go back and still had access to the system. We found that to be a cross-pollinization, if you will, of ideas that weren't just from one organization or maybe even from one industry, but across the way. Um, some people used it more effectively and more intentionally than others, but everybody that we talked to seemed to give us fairly good feedback in terms of that as a service provided. Yeah, that's really cool. The idea of seeing the history in different industries. I love it. Thank you so much. You betcha. Thank you. And Phil, we're, we're getting close to time here, but anybody who wants to put, post a question for Phil, please, feel free to do so. I'll ask you a question, Phil. Um, it's kind of related to what Julianne was talking about. I know that there was discussions about um, this cross-pollination idea and some concerns about privacy. So sometimes it was, should it be segmented to one organization or should it be multiple? You want to, could you talk about that a little bit? 
Well, we always were very cognizant of that as a particular issue. And I would always, or one of my teammates would always stand in front of the group or communicate very directly. Remember, be careful what you post. First of all, don't post anything that is of any proprietary nature because others out there may be watching, but that's an online issue anymore as well. We should always know who our audience is, who may be participating, et cetera. So there's, there's the yin and the yang, if you will. There's the, there's the, if I share too much, will that be a problem? On the other hand, because people are sharing, there's a benefit to all, all involved. But we wanted make everybody to make sure that they did not go all in to the point of sharing everything with names and dates and, and, and you know, recipes and so on and so forth that would affect their business. On the other hand, in the topic of leadership, you know, there, there's nothing really new under the sun. Leadership is leadership. We need to learn from those who came before us so that others that follow us will be able to learn from us. You're here. And Julianne has posted, you may not know this term, but FERPA, basically, it's the same thing, except it's sort of different. It's not proprietary stuff. It's privacy stuff, but it's, it's all related. So excellent, Phil. Thank you very, very much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Okay, we're going to move on. Next, we have Melissa Faber. Uh, Melissa is at Northwest State Community College, where she is the professor of the, in the psychology department. Uh, she has an interesting topic, which is addressing academic integrity using question pools in the Sakai Test and Quizzes tool. So, Melissa, your turn. Hello, thank you, and um, I appreciate you allowing me to talk about my question pools and how I set them up. Um, first, I want to explain why I use test and quizzes in my classes. I have large, well, I shouldn't say large, I have survey classes. So we have a lot of information that we need to get to, yet they're also writing based. So one of my purposes for using the test and quizzes tool is to actually assess individuals understanding of knowledge, similar to everybody else. Why do we use test and quizzes? Um, but also I wanna give my students practice using multi, or actually answering multiple choice questions because many of them will have, um, end of term exams that they need to take in their program or they have licensure or certification exams that they also need to complete. But I also want to reduce my reliance on um, writing exam or writing assignments because it can be time intensive for everyone involved. I realized though, similar to in class, um, there are opportunities for students to cheat, which might be a little bit different for online learning. One, they can collaborate. They can be sitting next to each other. They can be sharing answers. They could um, text each other answers if they're gonna take it at a different time. They could even print and share hard copies or some other social media strategy. Um, they can also um, screen share or print the quiz and share with future students. Also, and many of you who are in academics share the same concern with testing quizzes. There's a lot of time and effort that goes into creating quizzes, uh, especially objective quizzes, um, brand new each semester. And we also need to be consider, considerate of students' limitations. For example, if they don't have a stable internet or they don't have a camera, we can't use some of the monitoring services that are available to make sure that cheating doesn't happen. So I worked with um, our curriculum designer in Psychot Sakai specialist, Christina Sweeber, and we came up with a solution and that was to create question pools. However, I wanted to make sure that I had question pools that pulled from all of my chapter objectives. I wanted each chapter objective represented in the quiz. So I created sub pools for each one of my pools. Um, to share an example, I have a question pool for this human growth and development test chapter one. This is now called my lifespan psychology. But for list and describe the areas of lifespan psychology, physical, cognitive, and social and emotional development, um, chapter learning outcome, I created a sub pool and you'll see the HGD areas of development and I have five questions. I will pull questions from this particular pool for my chapter quiz. As you can see, I have multiple sub pools for this one chapter quiz. Here I'm showing that I have a random draw. So when I create my quiz, I get to identify how many quizzes I wanna pull from each particular um, sub pool. I'm pulling one question. Melissa, I don't think we're seeing your slides. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry to Bye. interrupt. I bad. I, I didn't realize you were the, yeah. Share your screen there, young lady. <laughs> I am so sorry. Can you see my screen now? Not yet. We see your lovely face. <laughs> share screen. You're finding it in Zoom, the share screen button? Yeah. There we go. It's coming now. Okay. And what, oh, what lovely. I'm there you go. So sorry. Can you see which part of the screen can you see? We're actually seeing the, the entire PowerPoint, including the slides to the left. I didn't mean to take up my time doing this. <laughs> we'll forgive you. <laughs> we're, we're doing well on time. Now we're seeing we're seeing your your notes as well, but that'll that'll work. Yep, because I've lost the I've lost the part of my screen to actually show you my. I think if you go up to display settings, you can swap the view there. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Wilma. Just to the right of that. It's covered with my um, oh. <laughs> Zoom. Move, move us out of the way. <laughs> so now all of you can see why I need the help of Christina Schwieber. Technology isn't necessarily um, my um, strength here. There we go. Now you got okay. it. That's it. Success. <laughs> so, sorry. We even practiced this and I still messed it up. Um, here, here is um, the sub pool. This is the human growth and development um, sub pool. And I have the five questions. And you can see here that I have multiple questions in um, the sub pools that I've created for my test one. Here is the random draw. It indicates the random draw. So when you set up your test, you can select which sub pool or pool that you want to pull from, and you identify how many questions you want to pull from. Um, for this particular one, I have one question, but you can pull two or three different questions or as many questions as you want from that particular sub pool. Um, finally, I have some maintenance and points to ponder if you're considering this. One, similar to any other um, test um, that you might be creating, you're gonna have to review your, your pools for accuracy. You have to update your questions. And I do that every few years, or if I have a textbook change. Um, if you change the number of questions drawn from the pool for your quiz, or if you change a test pool name, then you're also going to have to change the quiz. However, if you don't make those changes, you don't have to edit the quiz at the same time. Um, also, if you're using multiple quiz pools or test pools, it is going to take or possibly could take students longer to pull up a particular question. So Christina has helped me with this. Um, I now present all of my questions on one page instead of having them advance through different pages. And um, I have also added time to quizzes. So if, for example, I have 15 questions, one minute per question, I now have 20 minutes, or I give my students 20 minutes to actually complete the quiz, just to give them that little extra time if there's drags in pulling questions. And now, if you have any questions, if there's any time left. <laughs> Oh, there's time. First, let's let's hear back from our our two uh, our, our our star users. Uh, Julianne, is it is it your turn to start this time? <laughs> sure, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, thank you so much, Melissa, and no worries on the tech issues. It happens. <laughs> it happens to me, and I zoom every day of my life, and I still can't do it right. So you're you're doing great. Um, I really appreciated your consideration of uh, the students, you know, in taking tests because I think a lot of times we have a lot of a lot of faculty who insist on using Proctor Track or um, the lockdown browser, that one's less in invasive. And I understand the reasons why, but I appreciate when faculty can find a way to create 
other or use the other tools in Sakai to prevent cheating that is less invasive and less taxing and less stressful for the student. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, I had I, there's lots of great questions in the chat that I want to take away from because those are all ones that we probably want answers to. But I had a question about how many questions do you think you have in a pool for a given test? So let's say it's an exam, like what what's the number that you're pulling from? And do you think that that is a good enough number that actually reduces the amount of cheating? Um, some of my pools are small. For example, um, you could if you could see my screen, um, I had maybe two questions per question pool. Um, and, and that's just because it's more it's a more direct objective that I want everyone to have a very specific um, question or similar types of questions. Um, some of my question pools have 15. Um, so it all depends on how complex my chapter objective is also, um, or the intent of that particular question. And for some of my quizzes, I don't use pools for every one of the question slots. So I might have a very distinct question that everyone gets. Um, but again, I realize there's probably some, well, I know there's cheating that probably occurs with that. It's nice to be able to mix and match between the questions. Like everyone's going to yes. get this question. Some people get the pool, and then you've just built out the test in all these different formats. I love it. Thank yes. you. Very mm -hmm. good. Okay, Christina, you you know this one well, so your turn. <laughs> <laughs> what was what do you think is the biggest payoff of you know? It took a lot of time and effort to set up all those question pools. Do you consider the payout worth it? I do. Um, one, I can make sure that all of my chapter objectives are addressed. So I feel more confident about my quizzes, but the time and effort again on the instructor or the professor creating quizzes, it can be overwhelming if you want to recreate um, a quiz because I appreciate the feedback, the student actually having the quiz so that they can see what they did wrong because I think that's where they learn the most is where they see their problems. So I needed to find a way in which I could give them the feedback yet not overwhelm myself every semester. So well worth it. Good. Okay. Christina Moore? No. Okay. I'm 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 watching the questions come in. I'm going, we got to get to some of these. <laughs> so let's let's start with let's start with the the first question that was asked um, whether or not you use test banks and um, or you write your own questions. I think I know the answer, but what do you say to that? Yeah, um, my, my original import was from test banks. So a lot of my updates are my own questions. Um, I caution about using test banks though, because Google is probably some of our students' best friend and those test banks are out on Google. So mm -hmm. if you're going to use test banks, I still suggest altering the question. Ah, okay. But I have a mix. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. Um, just a quick question, and Christina may want to weigh in on this too. Um, I always kind of caution people that um, one page with a whole bunch of questions on one page is not a good idea because you, you then run the risk of a browser failing. But I understand why you're doing it. It's basically a performance issue. So pros and cons of that? And Christina may want to yeah, give her rationale too. Um, and, and one thing that I do share is um, occasionally they want to save their answers. Because if there's that browser failure, failure they could lose their answers. Mm -hmm. Okay, good point. But the, I mean, there is a tremendous risk. Yeah, I, most of the time I do recommend the instructors use the one question per page. But with Melissa using so many question pools in a single test, just to keep the, you know, reduce any potential lag for students and just to keep, you know, them from having that frustration balancing act. So, so basically what it's doing is when the one page comes up, it's going and getting all the, the question pool pieces as opposed to each new page is like, oh, wait a minute, I've got to go get you a question. Here you go. So, yeah. okay, fair enough. And the other way that you could address that is just add a little bit more time, but we live in a very rural area so I'm really concerned about internet stability. So, yeah. and then the more time I give them, those who have good internet have more time to use Google. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, Dave Evelyn's asking a question. Do you use the objectives and keywords parts of the pools um, or per question metadata options? Do you use any of those? No. Okay. So basically you are well-organized, you know, 
which objectives each of your question pools apply to, even if it's just two questions, you know where that's going to fit in. Yeah, and, and I guess I've created my own keywords and I've also identified the sub pool or I've identified the quiz that it would attach to or even the particular course. Since I teach psychology, for example, there's a lot of overlap. So I will label it um, GP um, behaviorism, um, AB abnormal psychology, as opposed to general psychology behaviorism, because mm -hmm. the, the questions are gonna be different. But yeah, I do have to label them with some kind of keyword that will help me. Okay, fair enough. Um, so let's see. Amy is saying, uh, have you considered students having students generate their own questions as part of their homework? That's yes. interesting. Yes. And some of those questions when I do, and I don't do that consistently. So that's not something that I have every semester, but when I do do that, I do then add them to the, the quiz bank or that, that sub pool so that future students could pull up that question. Ah, okay. Very good. Excellent. You got a thumbs up on that one. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. One more. Um, so let's see what I got so many to pick from here. <laughs> Uh, maybe this is a question that Dave is asking here. Um, I think those keywords can be used in the histogram to see performance data and the outcomes with a click, which is a reason to do that. And, and I'll add sort of my own question about that. I was taught a thousand years ago, I was trained as a, as a teacher as well. And, and we were done, a lot of work was done with statistics about questions, you know, the validity of a question. Does the fact that you are pulling random draws from different pieces make you worry about the statistical validity of your tests? Or is that something that we don't worry about anymore? I don't know. No, I, I think it's a worry. Um, and, and I do look at the individual responses. Um, for example, I have an adjunct who has just um, reinforced my concern that um, some of these questions are being answered too quickly, um, but they're, they're consistently correct, or we're looking at um, inconsistencies in responses or similarities in responses. So we're doing that more, um, I don't know, old, the old fashioned way, instead of perhaps using the technology that sounds yeah. like is available. But yeah, okay. still a concern. Okay, very good. All right, we're going to move on to our last one. <laughs> Thank you so much, Melissa. I really appreciate it. All right, our last pre presenter is Joshua Ambrosius at the University of Dayton. Uh, Joshua is an associate professor of political science and the director of the Masters of Public Administration program at UD. He says he's going to boldly go where no LMS has gone before, showcasing his use of the lessons tool in his space exploration course. You'll explain that, I'm sure. <laughs> so thanks, Martin. Um, I'm happy to be here and uh, share a little bit about how I use the uh, University of Dayton version of Sakai Isidore in my SSC 200 space exploration course. Um, I should say, I'm not sure that I qualify as a Sakai star, um, but I do really like that the conference program says that my course is a star worthy site. Um, so you're gonna hear a little bit about a pretty innovative course, I think. Um, and it's not innovative because of what I do with it, but it's an example of SSC 200, which is an interdisciplinary social science course taken by all sophomores at the University of Dayton. So faculty teach on a special theme, in my case, space exploration, while introducing sophomores to social science from three disciplinary perspectives, in my case, political science, sociology, and economics, while covering five common course learning outcomes. So I'm going to just walk you through my page and how I use the lessons tool in Sakai, which I have renamed in my menu here, um, modules. So you'll see real quick, here's my overview page for the course. Um, most notably, there's a picture of me pretending to be an astronaut. Um, I also love, I, I, I'll add as an aside, I love this commons tool, um, which I use to post a space theme soundtrack throughout the course. So you'll see some of the songs here towards the end of the course. So let me click in and uh, show you the lessons tool in action. I'm going to show you three different types of pages that I use. So the first one is this overview of all the modules of the course. The iteration of the course you're looking at 
uh, is one of of dozens that I've taught um, over the past few years. And I do this course as an online course, asynchronous in the summer for six week terms. So students go through six content modules. So you can look at the um, overview page here, which includes the intro module, and then it includes the six content modules. I like this page because it lets me give them the topic of each module. It lets me give them the uh, estimate of the amount of time that they'll be taking to complete that module and the open date for each module, which opens on a Monday at 9 a.m. So let's go in real quick to the introductory module. So here you'll see some of the features that I use across all the modules. Um, and I'll, I'll spend less time here so we can get into one of the content modules so you can see all these features. But you'll notice there's a, an introductory text block there's a video pulled in from Warpwire video that introduces them to the course. There's a really useful checklist so they can keep track of everything they're doing as they complete each module. And there are these blocks at the bottom that include all the tasks that they're going to be doing for that module. In this case, going up to the syllabus tab, reviewing instructions for the project that they'll be completing throughout the term, and introducing themselves in the class forum. So let's go to module one so you can see all of the features that I use from the lessons tool. And I really like this lessons tool because it's a one-stop shop for all the course content. So it allows students to access all the other things that I've entered in these various other tools in one place each week of the course. So you'll see here again, I do an overview where I bring in some facts or anecdotes about the topic that week. In this case, um, I challenged the notion that it was hard science that put a human on the moon and that it had a lot to do with politics and economics. I include an introductory video from Warpwire. And if I go back to the top here on the right-hand side, you'll see I include important dates, both for that module as well as the date at the end of the course. So that's always in front of them, um, each module. I include that checklist, which is nice. They can say, oh, I've watched the intro video. I've completed the readings, et cetera. And I include the learning objectives for each module that map to the course learning outcomes for the SSC 200 course. And if I scroll to the bottom, You'll see all the content for this module. You'll see the readings, which I've um, uploaded to the resources um, tab. Um, so students here can click on each one without having to go into resources. I bring in supplementary materials. In this case, there's a TED Talk that introduces them to social science. So I've embedded that from YouTube. The discussion forum. Um, the topic is here, um, and typically it disappeared since this was a previous iteration of the class, I believe, but there would be a link right here to the discussion forum for that week, so they don't have to go up and navigate the menu um, on the left-hand side. And then each module's short assignment, in this case, a proposal for the longer-term semester paper that they'll be working on, um, they can click right here and have access to submit that particular assignment. So this is how I use the lessons tool. Um, I really like it because it's simple, clean, easily digestible. It's a one-stop shop for students where you can make use of all these sub tools. Um, everything that they need is in each module for my course. Um, this is a real step up from when I first started many years ago using the Isidore tool and would have students clicking around to assignments, to resources, et cetera. Um, and I, I just love that everything is right there for students to access. Um, one student in this class even commented in the student evaluations that it was the best organized online course they've taken. Um, and I credit that to... Um, of course, to UD's Center for Online Learning. Um, I was an e-learning fellow or an ELF um, during spring 2020, which we all know 
is the uh, semester interrupted by a global pandemic when we all frantically started to move our courses um, to fully online for a bit. And it was very helpful to, uh, to work with Julianne and others at the center um, to better understand um, the Sakai platform. Um, so with that, um, I will stop. Um, I will add one last thing, that if you're interested in the course itself, I have a paper that you can access in the conference program, um, which will tell you about the class, both the SSC 200 um, at the University of Dayton, which is an innovative gen ed approach to social science education, but also more about my topic. That way we won't get distracted here by, you know, questions about what it's like to uh, teach about space. So Martin, thank you. Yes, wonderful. So let's see, Christina, I'm going to you first this time. Is that right? I've lost track where I am. I think so. <laughs> okay. So feedback, questions. I really liked the organization. The collapsible sections made it really clean, um, but also still made it very easy to navigate. So I thought that was really neat. Um, I'm going to ask about something I've debated with my instructors. On the left, I saw that you've got um, your modules expanded there so they can see the entire list and collapsible there. Um, do you see that? What are your opinions on the pros and cons of that collapsible um, versus just having the single modules where they would then see the list of start here, module one? Yeah, I, I like that they can they can see the full map of the course. Um, everything that we'll be doing. Um, I do have, as I noted here, um, that I do have them um, locked by date so they can progress through each module at a time. Um, I think, uh, I, I do like though that they know exactly where we're going. Um, given that it's a summer class, that does mean that, you know, we have the occasional requests by students who are traveling to try and, you know, get early access and things. Um, as they know what's coming. Um, but I do like this, this collapsible um, menu of modules. Anything else, Christina? No, I, that looks very awesome. <laughs> I, I agree. All Thank right, <laughs> Julianne, let's hear from you. Well, Josh, obviously, I know your course very well. Um, I love how you've integrated your personality throughout the course. I think that's a challenging thing for many instructors. And so it was great to work with you where I said, let's add some space stuff, especially since, as you may be able to tell, I've got some space stuff going on in my own personal hobbies. So I love like the Neil deGrasse Tyson and the and the playlist that you're making every semester. So that's fantastic. Um, I, and I really like that Sakai kind of makes it easy to put that personal, personal touch in there. Um, one question I did have was about your checklist. I'm curious to know, uh, you can, in a checklist tool, you can see who completed which tasks every week. How often would you say you check on that? And then if you do check on it, do you make any decisions or reach out to students or anything like that? Yeah, I I do not um, I do not use it as a way to follow up on student progress. I use it instead as just a tool for individual students to keep track of their progress. Um, I, I could do that, um, you know, given that the modules are one week, um, and it's pretty quick turnaround. Um, you know, I can I can track whether they're watching the warp wire videos, um, whether they've made the first forum post um, midweek. Um, I think that could be helpful. This fall, I'm going to be adapting this six week summer class to a to a full semester format um, that's going to again be asynchronous. Um, so they're going to be navigating probably each module over the course of two weeks. Um, so I think that's a good point that it might be useful for me to use that checklist as a way to kind of follow up on progress more um, so that students aren't spending, you know, two weeks doing nothing. And then, uh, you know, Sunday, you yeah. know, trying to trying to do the do entire you know. modules worth of work. So, right. We have a question in the in the chat. Um, do you have your own CSS for these modules? That's a that's just something quick to to know. Is this 
Is this customized CSS or are we looking at straight out of the box Sakai? Josh, I can tackle that if you do, if you, yes. if you're yeah, not sure. If you want to, if you want to jump in, Julia. Um, I think this is, there might be a little bit of custom CSS on the checklist uh, in particular. It's been a while. We, we've been doing a lot of custom CSS stuff, but a lot of this is, most of this at this point is now our uh, out of the box Sakai. So we've built in like the learning objectives that, that is a template that's available for our instructors. It's just one button click. The uh, important dates is one button click. So that's one other powerful feature of Sakai is that we are able to add those kinds of things as we hear requests. But I think the blue background on the checklist is custom CSS that is uploaded to Josh's course. Okay. Um, yeah, so we have a question, what is CSS? But that's probably a question for another day. Um, let me let me ask um, one last question. Do you, because you're, you're doing lots of stuff here, Josh, do you adjust the left nav as the semester progresses or do you basically it's ready to go when you start? Yeah, it's it's ready to go when I start okay. um, having having developed this um, as as part of the e-learning e fellows program. Um, I've I've generally stuck with the same template the last few summers. Um, I'm going to be doing a redesign as this summer comes to a close for the fall, um, probably keeping most everything the same. Um, but, uh, but I think, I think it's worked really well. Um, and if you take a look at the, the paper that I have uploaded, um, I actually have an appendix in there that includes a lot of, uh, of student comments about the class. Um, not all of them are related to the online iteration of the class. Um, but, but some of them are, and they reflect that generally, you know, students are quite pleased with the organization. Yeah. Um, and, and again, I just, I love this lessons tool. Um, it's a real step up over, you know, having students have to navigate, you know, all over the menu for, for everything that they need to do to complete the class. And it's something I've even taken into my in-person classes, um, which at the University of Dayton, nearly every instructor for every class is using Isidore at this point to supplement their in-class instruction. Yeah. Um, and 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 I think during the pandemic, we all learned a lot more about online teaching, um, and we're integrating that into every iteration of every course we teach. So excellent. Well, this is this is great. I mean, this this is a model class. This is what classes ought to look like. So well done. This is good. So we're out of okay. time. Um, I have to say, this was an exciting hour. It just flew by. Um, I learned a lot of new things uh, about Sakai that I'm going to put to use, and I hope everybody else did too. Special thanks to our four presenters. Amy, Phil, Melissa, and Joshua. They did a great job. If we could applaud, we would. You can do that in the chat. Um, and a special thanks to our two super fan panelists, uh, Julianne and Christina. The insights and feedbacks you provided were really, really helpful. So this was really great, folks. This will wrap it up for the showcase. Our next session starts um, at 40 minutes past the hour. So in about 10 minutes, or actually nine minutes now, I'm over. Sorry about that. Where the topic is going to be Sakai rubrics. We've already talked about that a little bit. That was a a whet your appetite kind of thing. So until then, this is your host, Martin Ramsey, signing off. <laughs>